All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so it's about 12.30 now, and so we're going to pick up from here. Uh, after each of these talks in the packets, I have um, some reflection questions. And the idea with those was uh, we're going to have some reflection time this afternoon, and I just wanted to supply some options if you needed some material to meditate on personally. But... Uh, the intent is more just things to think about, um, some follow-up with some of the ideas that we're going over, uh, and even a resource that you can use um, after the day is over, you know. Um, certainly part of the intention here is that today is really a beginning, you know, a, really a beginning of an in-depth appreciation of, study of, understanding of the Gospel of John. And uh, so the idea of the reflection questions is just to give you all some resources to help continue and deepen that study as uh, your own personal faith journey takes you. So to start this afternoon, we're going to explore um, the Eucharist in the Gospel of John. And to begin that exploration, we're going to go back to chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. In chapter 1, we have the scene where John the Baptist is pointing out Jesus to his own disciples. So in verse 29, he says, The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, we hear a phrase like that, especially as Catholic Christians, and it just kind of rolls on right past us. Why? Because we hear it every week. And when we get accustomed to these things, it's often easy to lose sight of the underlying significance of it and what's amazing about it. And in fact, the reason we keep repeating it every week. So we're going to take our time this afternoon to try to explore this a little bit. When John the Baptist announces Jesus as the Lamb of God, what is it that he's saying? So, when we think about the idea of the lamb, what immediately would come to mind for a Jewish audience is the Passover. So to review, there were the 10 plagues and Pharaoh would not let his people go. Or there, or there was the first nine plagues, sorry. We were on the 10th. Uh, so there were the nine plagues Pharaoh would not let God's people go. So God gives them some instructions. He says, I'm going to bring this 10th plague. And in this 10th plague, all of the firstborn children in the land of Egypt are going to die. But if you don't want death to come to your household, here are your instructions. You know, and he gives a list of specific instructions for uh, preparing and killing a lamb. And then putting the blood of the lamb on the uh, top of the doorway to the house. And he's basically saying if your house is marked with the blood of the lamb, the firstborn will live. The firstborn will not, will not perish because the lamb has been sacrificed in their place. So, <clears throat> something very important about the Passover is that the lamb was to be eaten as part of the Passover. And he even had some highly specific instructions for that. The Passover lamb was not the only instance, however, of animal sacrifice among the Old Covenant people. In addition to the Passover lamb, there were numerous animal sacrifices enumerated in the book of Leviticus for various situations. And part of the overall 
liturgy and ritual around the sacrifices is that the primary place in which they occurred was in front of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. Uh, as an aside, I should mention, I first learned about the existence of the Ark of the Covenant around the year 1980 in a movie theater. <laughs> and <laughs> when uh, I saw that particular cinematic masterpiece, and I'm not being sarcastic, uh, it was clear that the Ark was something really important, right? There was a lot of power associated with the Ark, and the bad guys wanted it, and in, in their own way, they got it, uh, you know, in, in the end. But this is just to emphasize the centrality of the Ark to the Old Covenant people, and its centrality came around the fact that it's where the tablets inscribed by the finger of God were stored. That meant... That the ark was a focal point of God's presence on earth. Being in the presence of the ark was being in the presence of God. And that's where they performed their sacrifices. So with the background of Passover in mind, we're going to jump back into the Gospel of John, specifically to the cleansing of the temple. So, this is chapter 2, starting at verse 13. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Okay, so let's think about a lot of ingredients behind this. <clears throat> Passover was coming, and Jerusalem was a particular focal point for the celebration of Passover because the ark was stored in the temple in Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. <clears throat> so why are they selling these animals? It's for people to buy the animals to use for various sacrifices. Okay? He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. Whoa. Um, so this was a pretty dramatic action. And the background, the context, is that the way in which the animal sales was occurring was fundamentally uh, exploitative. And something that Jesus was, obje was objecting to on that level. But it goes <clears throat> deeper than this. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. So what's being quoted there is uh, Psalm 69. And the importance of that quotation is the fact that this is a messianic act. For Jesus to come into the temple and overturn the tables was staking a claim to be the Messiah at that moment. Only the Messiah could do that. And so look at the response. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So what's interesting here is that the Jews know that in principle, the Messiah has the authority to do what Jesus did. And now what they're saying is, Okay, you did this thing. You're making this claim. Now, substantiate the claim. Prove that you are who you say you are via these deeds. <clears throat> he answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Okay, let's pause here for a minute. First is to emphasize that the temple was having to be rebuilt because it had been destroyed in warfare. Uh, so the original temple under Solomon was no longer in place at this point, and it had had to have been rebuilt. And so there had been an ongoing project to complete the rebuilding, and that's what they're referring to when they say the 46 years. But now Jesus is saying... He was speaking about the temple of his body. So think about this. 
What makes a temple sacred is the presence of God. So Jesus is saying, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The temple of his body. He is making an explicit claim to divinity here. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. And so the fact that this is all happening at Passover is no accident. And at this moment, we're actually going to jump ahead to his crucifixion for a moment because coming off of this phrase, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, and him saying it at Passover gives us an opportunity to meditate just for a moment on an important aspect of the crucifixion. So if we go to um, 1 John uh, chapter 19, and we look at verses 14 and 15, we see the following. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. That's Pilate, of course. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. So the point is that as Jesus is being handed over to be crucified, it's the preparation day for the Passover. Well, as a practical matter, they didn't start slaughtering the Passover lambs at, at dusk. You know, in principle, it might, they might want to wait until sundown. But they actually started earlier in the day so that they can get all of the lambs ready for dinner that evening. So Jesus is being sent to the cross at the time that the Passover lambs are being set up to be slaughtered. This is not an accidental detail. It's at Passover, the lambs are about to be slaughtered, Jesus is about to go to the cross. But the detail comes out in an even bigger way a little bit later. So, if we look at verse 31 of this same chapter, Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So see, at this point, Jesus is dead, but the other two criminals next to him are still alive. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So the significance here is uh, then this scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. What scripture passage is that? It's Exodus 12, 46, which is a reference to the fact that you're not supposed to break any of the bones in the Passover lamb when you're eating it. So we can see what's being set up here. Recapitulate the themes. The Baptist introduces Jesus as the Lamb of God. Jesus, during the cleansing of the temple, emphasizes the temple of his body that will be raised up in three days. And at the crucifixion, Jesus is sent along with the Passover lambs. And like the Passover lambs, not a bone is broken. This sets us up then to begin a detailed exploration of John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is frequently discussed when thinking about the Eucharist. And as we're going to see, there's very good reason for that. But what I really want you all to appreciate from this and from the experience of having read the entire Gospel of John this morning is that when we talk about the Eucharist in this chapter, we are not quoting any scripture out of context. In fact, from our experience this morning, you've got the whole context in your head as we examine this and as we explore this. Furthermore, with these other details about the Passover and the Lamb of God, we can see that the theme of the Eucharist permeates the entirety of John's Gospel and not just chapter 6. So, chapter 6. After this, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. Bam! There it is again. Passover is everywhere in the Gospel of John. And everywhere that John talks about Passover, it's to emphasize Jesus as the Lamb of God. 
When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test them because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little bit. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Jesus said, have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. Jumping ahead a little bit, when the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. The multiplication of the loaves is a true miracle. <clears throat> this was truly miraculous. Every now and then you read a commentary or you hear somebody say something like, well, the real miracle is everybody had food stashed on them and they shared with each other. Well, no. Um, if you look at the context, that uh, can't possibly make any sense. Why would they make him king or want to make him king if he had just induced them to share with each other? No, there, there was a true miracle here. A true miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. And this miracle is an important backdrop for what we're going to see next. So I'm going to skip ahead to verse 26. Um, and this is the people who had partaken of the miraculous loaves came searching for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me. Not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. So they said to him, What can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. So they said to him, What sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So here he, they're, they're talking about having received the miraculous manna from heaven when they were wandering in the desert, and Jesus is saying, you thought that was good? Listen up. So now, <clears throat> he says, um, so they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Think about what it means for him to be saying this with the backdrop of the multiplication of the loaves. This is someone who can genuinely end the hunger that they are feeling. But I told you that although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. Because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it on the last day. So here he's emphasizing that eternal life is what one should truly be seeking. That even with the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves, that only puts aside hunger for a limited time. That there's something far greater that one can be looking for and one ought to be seeking. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him on the last day. The Jews murmured about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? So he encounters some opposition here. 
he's getting some pushback. He's making some big promises, but they're not really seeing how it can happen. Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. Here he brings to completion his discussion of the manna. That was a miracle. Listen for something greater. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. And now he doubles down. He was opposed in what he was saying, but he doesn't back down. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. <clears throat> Again, in context, he's getting all this pushback, and he insists that he is the bread of life. And now he's made it even more challenging. My flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So more objections. Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. So he didn't just double down, he tripled down. Every bit of pushback he gets on claiming he's the bread of life, he increases the claim. He makes it even more drastic. These things he said in the synagogue at Capernaum. Then many of his disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. So again, think about the context. Jesus is getting pushed back. And he gives not just an equal and opposite reaction, but a strong counter reaction. And he goes deeper and deeper. And the claims become stronger and stronger. And the resistance increases. And then he basically responds by saying, yeah, not all of you can handle it. Okay, this is what it is. You can take it or leave it. Right here. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus then said to the twelve, do you also want to leave? So this is pretty fascinating because at this stage, numerous disciples are departing because of a doctrinal dispute. Jesus is saying, this is the way it is. <clears throat> the response is, they go away. He looks at the 12 and says, it is what it is. Are you sticking around or not? It's up to you. Nobody's making you be here. Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. So it ends then with Peter's profession of faith. So let's put these pieces together and see where we're at. 
the Jews ate of the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb was sacrificed for their salvation. Now, what do I mean by that? First, it was sacrificed for the sake of preserving their firstborn, but the deeper reason was it was sacrificed so that they could leave Egypt and worship God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. We've seen that. It's proclaimed explicitly, and just like the Passover lamb has no bone broken, so too the Lamb of God has no bone broken. But it follows that Jesus if Jesus is the Lamb of God, if he is the true Passover, we must partake of his flesh. Just as the Jews partook of the flesh of the Lamb of the Passover. Jesus, in this discourse, makes this abundantly clear by insisting that we eat his flesh and drink his blood. But we're left with a bit of a puzzle. How precisely are we supposed to go about this? It doesn't seem terribly practical. Certainly in the moment, they were appalled. The answer comes back to the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. Just as Jesus miraculously multiplies the loaves so that all 5,000 could be fed, Jesus multiplies his body and blood for us under the appearance of bread and wine. In 663, Jesus says, It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. It is by means of the Holy Spirit, then, that this eternal life-giving miracle occurs. It is by means of the Holy Spirit that the body and blood of Jesus is miraculously multiplied for all of us under the appearance of bread and wine. <clears throat> God was present for his people through the ark in the time of the Old Covenant. In the Eucharist, Jesus remains present for the people of the New Covenant. St. Thomas Aquinas is one of my favorite saints for numerous reasons. And he wrote with uncompromising clarity about the nature of the Eucharist. The body and blood of Christ retain the appearance of bread and wine. There's nothing about our senses that can determine that the miracle has happened. There's no scientific instrument necessarily that I can apply to the body and blood of Christ to see that a change has occurred. Sometimes in the history of the church there have been Eucharistic miracles where it's been possible to see this, but generally speaking, to the senses, no change has happened. The senses cannot determine that they're the body and blood of Christ. What we have is his promise. And his promise follows through inevitably from the logic of him being the Lamb of God as described in the Gospel of John. Here, of course, at uh, St. Joseph, we have a perpetual adoration chapel. And I encourage everyone to make use of the gift of that chapel to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. For in the Eucharist, Jesus Christ is as present for every single one of us here as if we were seated on the shores of the Sea of Galilee listening to him preach. To conclude this section, I have uh, included um, a Eucharistic hymn that was written by St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, I, I included it in English, um, in an English translation. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to sing it. And uh, you all are welcome to join me or not, um, just as the Spirit moves you. Um, as I sing it. It's just kind of a time for meditation, for prayer, for thought. Like I mentioned, we've got the uh, questions for reflection that you can employ. Uh, the priests, uh, Father Jeff and Father Tony, will be happy to hear uh, confessions if anyone is so moved. Um, you know, they're here for that for you today. 
And uh, we will pick up on the next talk at, um, at 1.30. So if you want to have some conversation, I encourage you to go into the baptistry area to leave the church as a place for silence, uh, aside from the singing part, of course.